Well, hello there and welcome to another episode of Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants. Now, I see one of my roles with these podcast episodes as shining a light on the new and emerging technology that can quickly become a definitive part of any managed service provider's toolbox. Well, today we're looking at one of the most interesting platforms I have seen in quite some time. We're going to be taking a look at Zero Trust Security and specifically the Enclave platform. Now, Enclave effortlessly connects laptops, servers, home workers, cloud instances, containers, and IoT devices together across any infrastructure with Zero Trust network access. So today, I'm joined by Mark Barry. Mark is the co-founder and chief product officer at Enclave and has been integral to the development of the product and growth of the company to date. And he continues to focus on scaling the business. Now, Mark holds a master's degree in applied information security and has a deep background in security across government, enterprise, and small business organizations with a focus on building, researching, and securing computer networks. I'm very excited about this interview today. Mark, welcome to Tub Talk. Hey, Richard. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really great to join you. My pleasure. Where are you joining us from today? So I'm based down today in sunny Cardiff. Uh, I'm actually always based down in Cardiff. It just happens happens to be sunny today in Cardiff, <laughs> which is kind of unusual. But A little I'm bit like Newcastle upon time where I am. It's, uh, the sun doesn't shine all the time. I'm very familiar with Cardiff, I should say. I'll throw this in straight away. Massive Doctor Who geek. And of course, all the uh, lots of Doctor Who episodes recorded there, there in Cardiff. So have you ever seen the, the TARDIS floating around while you've been out walking? Well, actually, uh, in Cardiff, we used to have the big Doctor Who exhibition centre, but unfortunately, it was torn down uh, a few years ago. Uh, yeah. So, no, I haven't seen the TARDIS for some time. Oh, well, new series of Doctor Who coming up, but I won't, I won't bore you with that. Let's get down to business, Mark. But before we dive into Enclave, I'm sure I'm not alone in hearing a lot of talk about zero trust security. Now, not just for the benefit yeah. of the listeners, but for the benefit of me, what exactly does zero trust security mean? Okay, right. That's um, that's straight in at the deep end, isn't it, actually? <laughs> uh, I, so to me, this is such an interesting question, because I think depending on who you ask, uh, you'll often get a very different answer. Mm. Uh, and there's so much commercial interest now behind Zero Trust. Uh, I do worry it's starting to become a bit of a bandwagon term. Um, you know, if you're not Zero Trust, you're, you're sort of old news. And, I, you know, there's sort of a a raft of potentially overused marketing terms like next gen and uh, military grade encryption and uh, shift left and cyber. And I, I'm worried that zero trust is becoming uh, similarly one of those overused marketing terms, um, which can, I think, lead to some fairly polarized views, um, maybe some all or nothing thinking. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, you bring the, the false marketing claims and techies with a low tolerance for ambiguity. <laughs> yes, uh, and, yes. you know, I think I sent, I certainly sense a lot of frustration and confusion around zero trust, zero trust network access and, 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 and the, whole, the whole movement of the industry into this area, to be honest with you. And I do think there's a risk of it becoming slightly dogmatic. So I'll try and keep it really simple. Yeah. To me, it's an approach. Zero trust is a way of thinking. Um, a model that assumes that our users, our networks, and our systems shouldn't be trusted. So to me, it's, it's, it's sort of the opposite of, of what networking has been for the last 30 years mm. and how networks were designed to function. Uh, you know, really, I think, think to, to me, it's an extension of principles like defense in depth and assume breach. You know, our, our goal here is to reduce the attack surface over the organization and reduce the the impact or the risk of a security breach. But you know, I think zero trust is a really big umbrella term, especially when you think about all of the moving parts of the organization. And so to me, you know, my observations of the industry is that there's this common consensus that has emerged, which is uh, you can't buy zero trust any more than you can buy assume breach. It's it, it's a mindset, and for organizations who are interested in, in embracing that mindset, uh, I think the starting point is to consider the tools and tactics which you can deploy that complement that mindset. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Let, which brings us on to Enclave. 
so for anyone unfamiliar with Enclave, and I'm, I must say I was up until uh, my, my great old friend Tom Davis, uh, who's got who works for you as your chief revenue officer. Uh, I've known Tom from uh, way back when in the uh, managed service industry. He got in touch with me about Enclave, uh, and, and I'm really, really intrigued uh, by this the whole concept of it. So in simple terms, how do you explain what Enclave does? Okay, so Enclave creates zero fast zero trust network connectivity between systems located anywhere on the public internet without opening any of your firewalls, adding edge devices, or changing your infrastructure. So in essence, Enclave is a corporate VPN, but it's it's a modern replacement to legacy corporate VPNs, uh, the genesis of which was in hardware, and Enclave is entirely software-based. It's the key value proposition here for us is convenience. Uh, we've we've always been a remote organization. We started before the pandemic, uh, and and effectively, we're not the only company. You know, a lot of, a lot of organizations have infrastructure and resources all over the place, and and we need an effective modern way to connect it all together. Uh, private networks have traditionally been quite hard to set up complicated and fragile to operate. And we effectively build that private access um, between systems, no matter where they are, uh, in a way that just works. Mm. Now, when I first, when Tom first mentioned that approach to me, I stopped in my tracks. And I'm sure there's people listening to this when you say like no firewalls and, and things of that nature. And you're like, what? The mind blown sort of thing. But I'm going to jump into the products a little bit more. But before we do jump into the product, tell me more about Enclave as a company. You know, how long have you been in business? You mentioned pre-lockdown. Uh, where's your team located? Are you all remote? Tell us a bit more about the uh, the people behind the product. So we've been building Enclave seriously. Uh, since about 2018, um, but exploring the idea since about 2016. So we did a lot of uh, market evaluation, customer discovery, things like this back in the early days to try and understand what it was that we 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 were we were onto here. So we had this idea that we could make VPNs better. Uh, so this is before zero trust really gained notoriety as an, as a concept and and, a, and an idea. Uh, and today we are a UK-based team. Um, and actually, we've been able to cultivate some really interesting links into some of the best security minds really on the planet. Uh, we we were part of the GCHQ and NCSC Startup Accelerator. Uh, we've been part of the London Office for Rapid Cybersecurity Advancement uh, Accelerator. We've received backing from Airbus and UK uh, EDUs. Uh, so... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we are a British company. We're proud to be a British company, uh, especially building tech, well, cutting edge tech in such a crowded marketplace uh, where the centers of gravity tend to typically be US, West Coast and, and Israel. Yeah, agreed. I'm fascinated by your background as well, Mark. I, you know, in the top of our conversation, I mentioned a little bit about it, but what led you to Enclave? Oh, uh, so... My background is fairly spotted. Uh, I mean, formally, formally, my education is in computer network security, uh, but I've spent a lot of time uh, at the coalface, at the uh, at the network layer, uh, as a network engineer, as an infrastructure engineer, as a developer, uh, but usually always, always with a view uh, through the lens of security. Um, in, in terms of what led us to Enclave, uh, well, my co-founder David Notley and I were working with some uh, UK defense primes, which created an opportunity uh, for us to focus our attention on traditional, at the time, traditional traditional VPNs. And we're talking the real low-level stuff here, uh, like using Strong Swan uh, to build IPsec tunnels. Um, and honestly, I've got to tell you, I'm just really lazy. <laughs> I, I, I am so lazy. If I can avoid doing the same thing twice... I absolutely will. That's not lazy, uh, my friend. That is smart. I, I got away <laughs> from using the term lazy for that exact reason, but I'm like you on it, yeah. Well, well look, I mean, so if if for no other reason than the more times I do something manually, the more likely I am to make mistakes. Yeah, correct. Uh, and so we were in this really interesting situation uh, where we had a bit of support from the Defence Primes. We were 
effectively thinking about some of the challenges of VPN technology of, of the day. And that led us to ask questions about the, the range of crypto that you deploy in terms of a VPN, what supporting network configuration is required to build VPN connectivity, uh, what about the hardware, what about the maintenance of it. But really, most of all, I think our biggest question was the architecture. You know, why is it that we have to move all of our traffic through a central node, through a concentrator? And why does that concentrator have to be put out there onto the public internet uh, for everyone to, to, <laughs> to have a go at? Yeah. Um, so it turns out there's a much nicer way of doing this. And, and really, I think through serendipity, our updated architecture is actually extremely compatible with the principles of zero trust, which really started to gain popularity in terms of mindshare after the colonial pipeline hack in May 2021, mm. uh, after the Biden administration mandated zero trust for uh, federal adoption, which I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners probably already know about. Mm. We have teased to the listeners long enough with this. I'm, I'm so excited to get into the, you know, the, the 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 guts of this product here. So let's talk about the Enclave product. So you've already mentioned VPNs, virtual private networks. Many MSPs are going to be familiar with that. So explain a little bit more. Why is Enclave different to a virtual private network? Why is it different to a VPN? Mm. So there's a lot of options out there for private network connectivity. Um, and uh, really, a core technology difference for us is that our product is based around uh, what's known as an overlay network, uh, a mesh, mesh overlay network. Uh, and that basically is an architecture in which systems and devices talk directly to one another over the internet. And that's really different to the client server model where machines talk to one another through a concentrator sat somewhere in the office or in the cloud. And effectively what we've, what we've done with Enclave is to build a technology that enables devices to talk directly to one another through closed firewalls. And we've built a, a centralized policy-based management engine around that that allows you to express policies that are modeled after the business and the business's connectivity requirements. So for example, I need my developers talking to my development environments rather than having to say, look, you know, here, here, here are the, the ports, the IP addresses, the subnets, the ACLs, the routing tables, the VLANs, the credentials, the NAT, the firewalls, the secret keys, the certificates. Here's all the technical jargon. I need to translate my business requirements into technical jargon to get the connectivity that my business needs in the old VPN view. And for us, it's 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 a much, I'd argue, a much nicer experience for the administrators because we get to forget about the underlying bearer network. You know, is the device wired? Is it Wi-Fi? Is it cellular? Is it cloud? You know, now we don't have to install servers to provide the access uh, that we need. So, so it, it's a really big um, shift away from how we conceptualize build, the way in which we build private access. And it's this, this, it's this funny um, paradigm shift where actually if you, if you don't have to play around with the network anymore, then you actually have to work actively to make the network insecure, which is kind of the opposite position that we're in today, where we have to work to keep the network secure and to keep our adversaries out, out of the, out of the, out of, out of our resources, out of our workloads. Yeah. And as a former MSP myself, you know, I was licking my lips a little bit when I heard this uh, approach towards things, because, in, you know, it, it is, it, it's completely shifting things on its head. Something you said earlier, I'm going to jump into straight away. And because lots of MSPs listening to this are going to be like, what? What impact does Enclave on, have on traditional firewalls? These are the, you know, the, the the sort of edge firewalls that MSPs might manage for their clients. Uh, so I have a, a metaphor for this, actually, and and you have to tell me, Richard, if you think this is a, a terrible metaphor. Um, I mean, it's it's probably an imperfect metaphor for sure, because okay. most are. Um, but I I view this this shift in the way we think about our network infrastructure, the way we think about our firewalls 
as a little bit like vehicles. And so the vehicles that you and I grew up with are vehicles in which uh, the operator, the administrator, if you like, uh, has to constantly make micro adjustments while they use it. So if I want to drive from Cardiff to London, I've got to get in my car and for the entire duration of the journey, I'm responsible for the micro adjustments of that vehicle while I'm using it to drive down the M4. So I've got the steering wheel, I've got the gear stick, I've got the turn signals, I've got the accelerator, the brake, the clutch, all of these things. I have to be constantly involved in its operation. And we've got this beautiful shift now towards driverless vehicles where we, we're able to say to the, to the tool itself, I want you to take me to London. That's my, that's my business objective, if you like. And the tool figures out what's required to get you from A to B. Now, to bring that back to the firewall, to my mind, the best state for a firewall to be in is closed. That means it's doing its job. And it also means that's the easiest state to reason about the security of the device. But then we go and make firewalls weaker and harder to reason about by punching holes in them with network security groups and access control lists. And so Enclave is actually quite clever because it can no negotiate connections through closed firewalls and complex NAT configurations, uh, which actually means you don't need the ACLs and the NSGs anymore. So the way I think about this is that every time you deploy private access using Enclave, that's potentially one less access control list that you need on the firewall. And to me, at least, it's a really satisfying idea that I can drop a firewall right down to its default configuration state, totally closed to the public internet, and say, yep, that's it. My network configuration is done. We'll build the private access that we need for the organization using Enclave, and I'll, I'm never going to have to go down into the firewall and tinker again with the IP addresses and the ACLs and the subnets and all of that other stuff that we mentioned before. So, yeah. And this is why I say it's this weird paradigm shift where you sort of, if you close the firewall and use Enclave to build an overlay network for the private access, you kind of do have to go out of your way to make the network insecure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and absolutely, it's going to be an absolute paradigm shift, isn't it, for MSPs using these type of uh, technology. Okay, let's dive a bit deeper into this. So MSPs are notoriously time poor. They've got way too many things that they need to do. So there's going to be people listening to this and saying, this sounds amazing. I'm going to find out more. But really, the biggest question they're going to ask is, what does a deployment look like? Because if it takes longer to deploy the product than it, you know, uh, than it does to actually administer and that, uh, it's going to be a problem for MSPs. So what does an enclave deployment look like? How long does it typically take, Mark? This is such a good question. As part of building a product, we we really keep an eye on the pulse of the network of the network, <laughs> the pulse of the pulse of the marketplace. Yes. And a lot of the feedback that we've had from some of our customers and partners is that it often it does actually take a very long time to move from a VPN to a zero trust network access product. And and there are lots of different lots of different architectures for zero trust network access technologies. And the overlay network just happens to be the most um, recent, and in my mind, um, the most interesting uh, mm -hmm. architecture. So in terms of how, how the, the overlay network architecture uh, is deployed, for us at least, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's this really neat process where you install Enclave and enroll your devices and systems to your account. So as an admin, you would generate an enrollment key on the platform and then pass those enrollment keys out to your end users, your servers, your containers, your IoT devices, whatever it is that you're bringing into the platform. The step two is to set up the policy that you want. And for us, this is a real strength. Uh, we apply labels, which we actually call tags to each system. Um, and as I mentioned before, one, one great example of this to conceptualize is I've got a bunch of devices that are belonging to my development team. And I've got a bunch of development environments. And my development team might be all over the place and my development environments might also be all over the place. Uh, and they might need access to staging or development or production, you know. So as an administrator, you will define tags that make the most sense for your business. 
and then create a policy out of those tags that says, well, any systems that are tagged as developers should be able to talk to any systems tagged as development environments. Right. And step three is, well, that's that's it really. Uh, Enclave is, you know, as soon as you've, built, you, you've established the policy, Enclave will build the private network. It's just there uh, without any faffing about. Uh, so you can short circuit all of that technical mess uh, all of the time that you might have previously spent translating business requirements into technical language and connectivity changes, and now you've just got closed firewalls, and you can just go and get on with other things that that actually you know make a difference to the bottom line of the organization. So, it, it, in many ways, it can feel quite magical. Mm. Yeah, that absolutely. In fact, to that point, there's a few questions that are bouncing around in my head immediately as like a, as a techie geek. Um, I know some MSPs have clients who have got a need for, say, fixed IP addresses with internal servers. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's just one scenario there. Tell me, how does Enclave work with the need for fixed IP addresses? Out of the box, we provide static IP addresses in the overlay network. And DNS, actually, name resolution services, um, first-class support for this. So whether you're consuming workloads you know, in the traditional sense, or you start consuming those workloads across the overlay network, it's really transparent. Uh, there's really no diff no perceptible difference. You still access your workloads with a, a DNS uh, DNS name, and you know the expectation of static IP address is, is just there. Mm. And, and the reason this just works so seamlessly is, be is precisely because of the overlay network, the, the virtual network that we build that is sat on top of the real internet, that overlay network only exists between the systems which have been connected because there's a policy there that supports the established trust between them. And so really, we can use whatever IP addresses that we like to move traffic across the overlay network. Um, but we do, by default, provide static IP addresses. Uh, and for us, there's a huge focus on usability and how easy it is to set up and terminate private connectivity using Enclave. So it's all about how quickly can we get this deployed. And for us, the average deployment from zero to bringing on your first systems is two or three minutes. It's really, really quick. Wow. I, you know, I mentioned one of the roles of this podcast is to highlight new solutions for MSPs to put in their toolbox. Enclave is certainly at the cutting edge here. I, I got to tell you, Mark, I'm the reason I'm so excited about recording this episode is so I can share it afterwards with not only MSPs, but a number of security professionals who I've interviewed on this very show, because I genuinely do think this is going to be a game changer. I'm going to try and preempt some of the questions that the audience might ask, though. So we've asked about IP addresses, fixed IP addresses. What about Enclave's integration with other products and solutions? So uh, tell us a little bit more about your integration strategy. So, so for us, integrations is a huge, huge part of what we aim, aim to do. Um, so we talked about policy before. Uh, one example of integrations is how deeply integrated we are with Azure, for example. So single sign-on and conditional access uh, is something that we bring to Enclave policies through a concept we call trust requirements uh, that allows you to enrich and augment whatever access that you've already got in place through the policy with things like MFA or whatever conditional access policies are already defined in, so for example, Azure. But we've we've actually got a lot, a lot of integrations that are perhaps a little less common. Um, so one of those, one of our, our more recent integrations is with a US-based company called Gradient. Uh, and Gradient are quite an interesting company because they help MSPs save a lot of um, time with billing reconciliation, uh, which I think you know, I think that can be a real headache for some MSPs. And and Gradient, this really interesting product, this that disintermediate. Let me try that again. That disintermediates that relationship between the vendor uh, and and the MSP. So the vendor integrates with Gradient, and the MSP just deals with them in terms of the billing and the reconciliation. So it's it's a really nice idea. And if we're looking to to highlight. Uh, Tool, tools in the toolbox for MSPs, then I definitely suggest checking out um, Gradient, that they're meetgradient.com. They're a really cool company. 
Yeah, that's uh, founded by Colin Knox, wasn't it? Who's a, a veteran of the MSP industry, if if I've got my uh, names right there. So we're going to have to get Colin back on the podcast. We've not had him on for quite some time there. But uh, so integrations talked about, I guess the next question would be underlying architecture. So does it matter whether you've got Apple Macs in your network? Does it matter whether you've got PCs? Does it matter whether you've got... Linux devices. Let's just focus on the desktop and server first of all, and then perhaps we'll move on to network devices. But what does it what does it look like for integration with the underlying devices? When we talk about the zero trust network access principle, um, um, we want to be as close to the endpoint as we possibly can be, which for us means we need to build technology that runs everywhere. So yes, Windows, Linux, Mac, absolutely. Uh, we also have support for Chromebooks, uh, Android, iOS, uh, Raspberry Pis, uh, containers, you, you name it. We can run in GitHub Actions as well, Lambda Functions, serverless. Um, the one thing I, I would say, of course, is that um, my personal experience now for building a product that runs everywhere is, my goodness, what a nightmare iOS and Android uh, to develop for. I mean, I was about real... to say, I saw the notification the other day, the news uh, that you put out about, I was going to ask about smartphones, mobile devices, but tell us a little bit more about the headaches that went into that then. Oh, it's, it's. I mean, it, it, there's, there's such uh, locked down devices, um, which of course has strengths, trade-offs and weaknesses like, like everything does. Um, but there are some real engineering challenges uh, to bringing an architecture like Enclave to life in a, in a device and an environment that was conceived of in terms of private connectivity, expecting an architecture that was designed 30 years ago. Uh, so <laughs> so it's, it, it's, 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 it's a real point of pride um, for us and, and our engineering team that we've got the iOS and the Android devices out there because it was a real, <laughs> a real nightmare. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so now we've got these fantastic use cases that we can support like mo mobile workers connecting back to their their internal private apps. Uh, you know, we can route traffic through an enclave gateway uh, from mobile devices to get gain access to systems like Office 365 or Google Workspace from predictable IP addresses. You know, we can bring um, mobile devices uh, into into production systems uh, in terms of break glass access. There's, there's some really cool things that we can do using Chromebooks and Android in the um, classroom systems. Uh, remote monitoring of critical OT. Yeah, there's a, it, it's opened up a, a whole range of new use cases uh, for us being able to support Android and iOS. So we're all super excited about being able to bring that um, bring that to the market. And so we've we, we've got that live and in use now, and yeah, everyone's really happy that we can sort of move forwards um, with the product and not not be lost in the weeds of de <laughs> developing for the App Store anymore. <laughs> uh, well, congrats on getting that done. Um, I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into something. So you mentioned about, you know, UK-based team, but you've got remote workers and things. My business, of course, I'm not an MSP anymore, uh, mm. more, I guess, more of a media company, but my business is built off the back of a, a team of remote workers. We've got folks in South Africa, the USA, uh, the UK, Europe, all over the place anyway and increasingly of course mark i'm not alone you know lots of msps listening to this may have been office based but then the pandemic came along and now they've got a remote team so how does enclave work with remote staff and let me expand that question before you answer how does it work with remote staff subcontractors suppliers other external partners of that nature <laughs> in a word effortlessly so really we've spent a huge amount of time making sure that Enclave plays nicely with existing technologies. Uh, not everybody, not everyone has the opportunity to build their private connectivity and access from scratch. So we're acutely aware that non-disruptive, incremental deployment is hugely valuable uh, to partners and customers uh, who are looking to improve their security posture whilst they phase out uh, the legacy technologies like VPN servers that are, all, are ultimately a bit of a, a security risk to the business. So re really, it, it makes no no discernible uh, difference to Enclave whether or not you're onboarding uh, someone in South Africa or someone in the UK or someone in the US or somebody in a different organization. Uh, it's, it's, it's the same simple process um, as it is internally. And you just make sure that the policies reflect the business connectivity requirements that you need. Uh, and if you decide to work specifically with subcontractors, for example, you would provision a subcontractor's enrollment key. Uh, 
Right. And that, and that enrollment key will have a set of properties that say, hey, the subcontractor is only allowed access to these workloads for this time period under these conditions. And the really nice thing about that is that because those because those security properties are imbued into the enrollment key, you can set and forget it knowing that that subcontractor will be booted out as soon as the time constraint expires or as soon as the trust requirements are no longer met. So it makes the entire system really, really, I'd argue, really easy to reason about and understand. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's going to be people listening to this, of course, who say, okay, this sounds as though it's going to be uh, a good fit for enterprises. This sounds as though it's going to be a good fit for certain types of small businesses. Of course, I would argue, and I'm guessing you would argue as well, Mark, this should be the default for, for everybody uh, going forward. But we speak. I speak to a lot of MSPs who still have this problem with their clients, and their clients think, oh, you know, we're just not a target for cyber criminals. You and I both know... You know, we're smiling as we you know, speak now. You and I both know cyber criminals aren't interested in just the big boys. They're interested in any targets, even small businesses and micro businesses as well. So with Enclave making MSPs client systems dark effectively to the public internet, does that mean that they are significantly safer? How much of a, um, a not a guarantee, that's the wrong word, but how much uh, a backing would you put behind this? Okay, so that's a really good question. And Lockheed Martin produced a really interesting um, uh, thought model, uh, which describes the eight phases of what they've termed the cyber kill chain. Okay. And really what that is, is, is your opportunities to disrupt a cyber attack. And the first uh, point on that kill chain is reconnaissance. So that's your first opportunity to disrupt uh, an intrusion into your organization is at the reconnaissance phase. Mm. Step two is intrusion. Step three is exploitation. And as we move through to the back end of the kill chain, we're talking about denial of service and data exfiltration. So when we talk about making ourselves more secure to threat actors on the internet, to my mind, uh, you know, defense in depth is, is a robust and well-established approach to bringing security into the organization. But I would definitely advocate for the sooner, the better. And when we start thinking about what does going dark mean? Well, really, it means closing your firewalls. And if you're running a, a VPN server that's sat out there on the public internet, waiting for your staff to approach and connect with, well, it also needs to be accessible to potential adversaries. And that puts the organization fundamentally at risk of relatively benign things like informa information disclosure. Um, but, you know, going back to the colonial pipeline hack that kicked off the zero trust uh, movement into popular mindset, that hack was achieved through credential stuffing into the VPN. Mm. And back in 2021, uh, which was when the colonial pipeline hack happened, uh, the UK's NCSC took the uh, relatively unusual step of publishing uh, guidance um, advising the general public that there were zero-day exploits circulating for some of the more common and well-known vendors in the space uh, who sold VPN servers with things like hard-coded credentials. Uh, and so really, I think as soon as you put you put a gateway, a door into your network out on the public internet, you are fundamentally at risk. You're fundamentally vulnerable to the entire breadth of, of potential attack from denial of service right through to zero day exploitation of the product. So to me, there's a bit of a mind shift, mindset shift here again, which is, you know, to borrow some military parlance, if, if you can't be discovered, then it's very hard for you to be targeted. Yes. Even if even if your adversary is in possession of a very advanced weapon, if they can't point it at you, then you are fundamentally in a better place than you would be if they could. Uh, and so if you follow the logic through, if you can't be discovered, then you can't be targeted. And if you can't be targeted, then it's much harder for you to be attacked through those mechanisms. So I, I would I would absolutely suggest this represents a net shift in your general security posture if you can close the firewalls. 
and take your private systems off the public internet. Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. And um, we've talked about private systems such as servers, workstations, uh, other traditional devices. We talked about mobile devices. What about the, I'm going to call them the new breed. For many people, they won't be, but uh, the, the the modern infrastructure, virtual servers, Kubernetes instances, other modern endpoints of that nature. How does Enclave work with those? For me, at least, I'm, I'm used to very siloed connectivity. Uh, in, in the past, when I've been involved um, with building private access at different organizations that I've worked with, it's one technology for remote access and another technology for the data center. And then you have to glue those things together. And now we've got a brand new breed of technologies, Lambda functions and serverless. And it just it just strikes me as being ridiculous that we've got different technologies to bridge different parts of the organization together. and. I genuinely believe that the distinction between north-south traffic, the remote worker scenario, and east-west traffic, the data center, that should be a, that that distinction of which direction is the traffic flowing in should be absolutely irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant. Uh, and so, what we're building with Enclave is a single network backplane that works the same predictable way everywhere. And so, yes, absolutely. That includes Kubernetes. It includes containers. It includes serverless Lambda functions. It includes GitHub Actions. Wherever you have a touch point for your business operations, Enclave is able to reach that touch point and bridge the, bridge the private connectivity. And even if it's something as, as bizarre as one developer, laptop working from home, uh, accessing the development server on another developer's laptop working from home, you know, using the traditional tooling, that would be an absolute nightmare to arrange yeah. without backhauling the traffic through some other location. Um, and with Enclave, that, you know, the configuration of the bearer network just completely goes away. And I think the other thing that I'd say about this, uh, about the data center scenario, is that there is a lot of tooling in place already for you to build east-west connectivity in multi-cloud environments or hybrid cloud environments or service mesh environments. But I've got a bit of a problem with this, actually, because, you know, I think DevOps really is a promise. You know, we're in that DevOps space when we talk about these things. And I think DevOps is a promise to go faster. And it also means developers building infrastructure. And so many of these tools um, kind of expect the developer to come down to the infrastructure. And I kind of disagree with this because to me, it's reminiscent of this idea that, you know, we don't want to have to learn to build roads before we can drive. And I think there's this there's this beautiful simplicity about unification. If we unify all of the touch points where where our traffic exists and where our, our workloads and our resources and our people and our assets are, and we build the connectivity in a very simple way, there's a lot a lot we can gain from that if we bring all of that access under the same the same jurisdiction. Yeah. And I love the analogy made there about uh, roads and uh, driving, of course. Uh, brilliant analogy there. Now, I should say at this point, uh, Mark's mentioned a number of different resources. I've mentioned other uh, other things, other products and that. In the show notes for this episode, we will include absolutely everything uh, that Mark and I have spoke about. So you can get those from tublog.co.uk. Uh, let's talk about licensing. So a lot of people listening, they're going to be like, this sounds great. I bet it costs the earth. <laughs> so, Mark, I don't want you to go into pounds and pence here or dollars and cents, but talk, tell us about licenses. So, for instance, how is the Enclave, uh, the Enclave product licensed to MSPs? So there are, are a handful of organizations um, building technologies with this architecture, but we are the only company at the moment who are entirely partner first, partner focused, partner first. Uh, and our licensing model is... Very, very simple. And, and you mentioned um, my colleague Tom earlier, and, and he's, he's super passionate uh, about building uh, relationships, uh, deep and sensible relationships with our partner community. So we have an MSRP with discount built in, uh, and we license on monthly, annual, or multi-year uh, options. Uh, our typical license is configured around device or user account. And of course, it's not always possible to install Enclave everywhere. Sometimes you've got things like printers, webcams, legacy devices, IoT, and other peripherals. So we have options to bring those devices into the overlay network as well. 
but no, we've really put a lot of effort into trying to ensure that we have a very simple pricing model and licensing model. Yeah. And talking to simple, you know, the product sounds from what you've described, simple to deploy, simple to maintain, but what about technical support? So we've got a global audience here. There's going to be MSPs in Australia, South Africa, North America who listen to this. We've mentioned your UK-based team. What do the support options look like and where are your technical support team based? Good question. So we are a growing business and we do plan to bring in 24-7 coverage soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't have that today, but ironically, despite not having uh, an SLA or 24-7 service at the moment, our support is really well received and we do already have a global client base. So in terms of support, our our partners have access to our local, and when I say say local, I mean UK-based engineering team. uh, And we actually have a direct, we give give our partners a direct line to our engineering team on Slack and using Google Meet. And so we put a huge emphasis on customer success. And so to date, all all of the queries, I'm I'm, (laughs) I'm not wrong here saying that that every single query that we've received has been resolved promptly, um, usually same day um, or within the same day. Um, But there's actually something else happening here. And I think it's really important to mention this because the architecture of Enclave sort of changes the dynamic ever so slightly. Because the byproduct of our architecture and our ethos of keeping things simple means that traffic doesn't move through our servers. We don't carry customer traffic. We don't see customer traffic. Uh, our SaaS platform is simply simply the coordination backplane from which policy is defined. And so if we have downtime, chances are none of our customers would even notice uh, any downtime for our SaaS platform is entirely non-disruptive to live systems out in the field, communicating directly between one another in that overlay network. Uh, and we also put a lot of effort into our online documentation. Uh, so we really want to make sure all of our partners have a solid understanding of our, how Enclave works and what the benefits are. Uh, but yeah, so supporting our partners is paramount and we're constantly reviewing this, especially as as demands in the US uh, increase. Um, but there's, there's a real nice, real nice uh, symbiosis here from the architecture where we traditionally lean into, oh, it has to be available all the time. But actually, once the connectivity connectivity is in place, uh, the the actual control plane um, can can be can be there or not be there, and the and the data channels remain constant and available. So it's again, it's an, it's an, it's a slightly different way of thinking about how you build the private network to the network connectivity in the first place. And I think we're often used to thinking about VPNs as um, points of failure. And, and so we need a certain level of high availability and assurance from the concentrator. But of course, if you get rid of the concentrator, uh, then you're in a different world. Yeah, uh, which is one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on the podcast here talking about this, Mark. You know, I like to bring new concepts, new ideas to, to the audience, to the managed service provider community. And this is going to be a mind blower for a lot of people. Now, you know, I mentioned you've got a master's degree in information security. You've spoken very uh, fluently, very technically here. Um, would you would I would you go as far as to say, like me, describe yourself as a bit of an IT geek? Uh, yes, I, I <laughs> definitely would describe myself as an IT geek. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm, I'm of course loving the background that you have behind you with the Atari and and and, and that gear. But so for me, at the moment, in in my spare time, I'm. I'm playing around with computer vision systems and depth perception. Uh, this is where you get two two cameras uh, to emulate stereoscopic vision. And if you know the space between those two cameras, in theory, you should be able to work out roughly how far away an object is um, as it shifts between those two cameras and their points of view. Of course, it's not really that simple. And, and I don't really have any end goal in mind. I just find it an interesting problem that I'd like to learn more about. So yes, I would definitely describe myself as an Isaac <laughs> Geek. <laughs> who influences Mark Barry? Are there any authors, industry experts who you admire and follow? Uh, I feel like I've been doing this for a, a reasonably um, lengthy amount of time now. But uh, I guess, you know, I really like 
I'm a big consumer of other people's ideas and thoughts, and I love to geek out on on different perspectives. Or oh, um, I suppose some of the more notable names in the space for me. Uh, there's there's a chap called Tavis Ormandi um, at Google. He's a really prolific and talented security researcher. Um, uh, you might recognize Mark Rosinovich, who's now a technical fellow at Microsoft, but wrote the original um, Process Explorer and Procmon, yep. um, which made my life so much easier back yep, in the day. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> and... Um, I also, I find um, Paul Graham's um, essays on his personal blog. So Paul Graham co-founded the uh, infamous uh, Y Combinator Startup Accelerator. And and he has some, I think, some interesting essays on his personal blog. So I suppose those are a couple of names off the top of my head of of, of people who I definitely admire and, and tend to follow. Yeah. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll include links in the show notes to those folks there. But what about online cybersecurity resources? So you're a, a student of the game, that, that much is clear. What cybersecurity resources do you use to stay current? Are there any resources you recommend to our listeners? So I don't know if I, I'm assuming this is relatively common knowledge these days, um, but I'm a huge fan um, of Hacker News and Reddit. Mm-hmm. Uh, the former, I think, is great for discovering new technologies, ideas, and concepts. And the latter is a really great place to take the general pulse and awareness yeah. of new technologies. Um, and but there's in the I, I, the thing that I really like about these two communities is they're real melting pots of content and curated content that doesn't necessarily come with commercial interest. And there's always something new to learn about or a perspective that I've not com- considered before. Uh, and there's another another re- resource called Lobsters. Um, that's uh, Oh, I I'm not going to try and <laughs> try and do the URL, but it's a similar similar uh, technical um, forum. Um, but actually, I also really enjoy talking to our growing community of partners because honestly, there is so much you can learn from just talking to your peers. Yeah, could not agree more. We've had so many. Um notable people from the industry like yourself on this podcast and almost without fail everybody has said you know the managed service industry working with your peers collaborating learning from one another there's no other industry like it it's absolutely you know fabulous so um, i know a lot of our listeners talking the community like me like you they love tinkering with technology so i couldn't help but notice that enclave have got a free option for individuals who might want to play with your technology have i understood that right Yes, absolutely. Enclave is completely free for non-commercial use. And we encourage all of our commercial users, partners to pick up Enclave, to use it, to see how easy it is to deploy, to manage, you know, really kick the tires before they operationalize it. And we are so, so keen to collect feedback uh, and listen to our users. I'm, I'm so passionate about building the best possible product that we can. I mean, for years years we've been stuck with really crappy (laughs) private access (laughs) technologies that are fragile hard to configure and just required really deep technical knowledge and when i was younger i used to get really excited about this oh i'm gonna play with a firewall the novelty soon wears off doesn't it it does it does and and at a certain point as you mature in your, your career you start to realize that's just it's just a drain it doesn't doesn't advance the business it you know it is it is a service to the business and if you spend your time in the weeds you you, it's just burning time then nobody wants that everyone wants to advance the business's core activities and i i sometimes affectionately describe myself as a recovering network engineer because of this (laughs) i'm biased but i i I mean of course i'm biased but i really i just can't imagine going back to the old way of doing things where there's a business requirement to build connectivity and everyone has to to stop for a second and say right okay please wait while we open another port on the firewall please wait while we set up a vpn server oh hang on a second you know we need to change an acl because an ip address has changed but what wait what was the ip address before or you know we've got to figure out which acl to update or <laughs> you know, you can't use the same subnet at, uh, at home because it's been used in the office. And then you have to deal with NAT and then we all start crying. Or well, there's not enough bandwidth for the VPN server. Or, you know, somebody's come along and deployed some VLANs and we all feel a bit more secure because of it. And it's just, to me, this is, this is yak shaving. 
Um, so yeah, I'm biased, but I really can't imagine going back to the old way of doing things. So yes, absolutely, free for non-commercial use. Uh, we really want everyone um, who's interested in what we're doing to come along and kick the tires and just see for themselves whether or not it's a fit for for the for, the, for their use cases and for their for yeah. their sensibilities. Well, I'm, I'm going to take a look at it myself, for, you know, and, and like you, I should say, back when I was starting out in the industry, I used to get a kick from uh, configuring firewalls, making stuff work. Well, it's the but process then, of understanding, isn't it? Exactly. You know, yeah. and then there was a point when I was running my MSP business and I moved really from being a technician to being a business owner. And I got more of a kick from stuff just working, just allowing working. me to get on with the business of growing. Oh, yes. So, yeah, I'm with you on that one. What's next then for Enclave? What can we expect in the next 12 months and beyond? Okay, so from a technical perspective, uh, it's integrations. Integrations and then integrations again. So growing our support for integrations with secure web gateways, EDR, SIEM technologies. So everything plays together nicely to ensure you know, identity-based access. Um, today, we're, 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 we're very focused on the network, uh, but later this year, we'll be bringing um, ourselves up to the application layer. And what I mean by that is um, providing tiles-based access. So, you know, here, here are the applications that we need to do our jobs. Click on the application, and, and there we are at, at that specific workload. And it's just a, a nicer user experience uh, than the, you know, here's, here's a network connection to a bunch of systems. Here's a, an application view of those systems. Um, we'll also be introducing role-based access controls over the next year um, for the administrators of, of the platform and extending trust indicators. So, you know, how can we influence policy, policy decisions about the real-time security yeah. posture of the endpoints and whether or not you know, access should be granted? But it, to me, in terms of the bigger picture, as I said before, Enclave is really about uni unification of private access across all of the parts of the business where there is private network connectivity required. Uh, and this, is, you know, this spans things like convenience, so making sure that it's not technical uh, to, to build this private access that it's easy to reason about and, and to deploy it anywhere. Uh, of course, that was zero trust aligned and that our partners are able to then bring that zero trust alignment to their, their end customers. And of course, as soon as you start thinking about the network in terms of unification, well, then you're carrying all the traffic through a consistent backplane. So your security controls become consistent. Your visibility increases uh, and of course, integrations, meaning, you know, deploying an agent to the endpoints uh, in as many scenarios as possible just gives us such enormous reach and integration potential. Um, but there's actually, I think, another, another dynamic at work here in the industry. And we saw this uh, with the advent of cloud. Mm -hmm. And we'll see it again with the advent of ML and AI. Uh, and that is uh, scarcity. So... Competitive, competitive advantage comes from technology scarcity. So the introduction of cloud originally had a couple of early adopters and they had a really disproportionate advantage over those who weren't early adopters. But of course, once a technology reaches mainstream adoption, it switches from being a competitive advantage to becoming table stakes. You know, you have to adopt it in order to remain competitive because it's just crazy to imagine doing it the old way. And I think the zero trust network access is definitely going in that direction. Uh, you know, to my mind, the VPN and the VPN server is having its blockbuster moment. It's, yeah, it's yeah. It, 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 you know, the genie is out of the bottle. This is a one way, one way journey. And there are many roads that lead to zero trust network access. Uh, the overlay network is one of them. Uh, we actually put together a small microsite. Uh, I think right at the beginning of this conversation, we started talking about overused um, marketing terms. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, we've been to the big conferences like RSA and Infosec. And honestly, actually, even even we got quite fed up with the outlandish zero trust marketing claims and the hype. Uh, and so, yeah, we think the Zero Trust Network Access is here to stay and that the community as a whole will benefit from honest, impartial and open knowledge about the architectures. So we've built um, a small microsite that is effectively 
an impartial but curated technical resource to help bring engineering discourse back to the conversation, highlighting architectures, approaches, options, strengths, trade-offs, and weaknesses. Uh, and so that website is zero trust network access dot info. It's all one word. Um, but you know, I'm I'm super interested to see how this industry unfolds uh, over the next few years because there, there at the moment there is a very small vanguard of companies who are building with this architecture. And to my mind, the potential for this architecture is enormous. So I'm super passionate about the space. I'm super passionate about talking to MSPs, engineers, developers, architects, security professionals, goodness, DevOps practitioners and hobbyists. Um, and, and just really curious to see how this plays out. Um, but I, I, I'm certainly, I've got, I've got big, uh, big hopes for what, what this technology uh, will do for us as, a, as an industry uh, going forwards. Agreed. This is so exciting to me. I said uh, genuinely how excited I was to uh, to record this interview with you, uh, Mark. I know we're going to get a lot of feedback about this episode. I just feel it. If anybody is listening to this, they want to continue the conversation with you or find out more about Enclave, where can they go to find you online? Uh, to find me online, right. Uh, <laughs> so I'm actually really active on our community Slack. Mm. Um <laughs> we, 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 we're trying to build um, a community space, uh, not just for our partners um, and, and for MSPs, um, but for anybody really who's interested uh, in this in this space to come and bounce some ideas around. And you yeah. know, we're really keen to talk to you know, like-minded individuals. Uh, for us, it's all about getting the network out of the way and better supporting partners and their customers. Uh, so yes, I'm really active on our enclave community slack which is enclave.io forward slash slack mm -hmm. uh, we as i mentioned we have the zero trust network access microsite zero trust network access dot info um, but yeah i'm also on the usual channels like twitter uh, so that's i think at mark underscore enclave and linkedin too Fantastic, Mark. I, I suspect, strongly suspect, you're going to hear from a lot of people as a result of this interview. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, my job, sometimes I have to pinch myself. I get to interview very, very smart people like you who are forward thinking and just geek out about this. But as we said, this is not just a technology. This is going to change the way people view security and just allow a lot of people to get on and to do their work so much more securely, so much more easier. So thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate your time today. Pleasure, Richard. That concludes this episode of Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants. I'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Hey folks, Richard here. Thanks for listening today. I know you've got a ton of options for who you listen to nowadays, so I really appreciate your support. Do you have any feedback on this episode? Ideas for future guests? Tweet me at Tublog using the hashtag TubTalk. I respond to every tweet and really appreciate your feedback. 